I want to eat your pancreas. That's not a threat. That's no joke. The title of an anime film that came out not too long ago. And no, it's not a horror movie about cannibals or zombies. Instead, it's a bittersweet coming-of-age romantic teen drama about two high school students learning what it means to be alive with other people. And no, they never actually eat each other's pancreases in the movie. Okay, look, if you're psycho enough to watch a movie where that kind of thing sort of happens, go check out Fresh. I also hope you like Sebastian Stan as a cannibal who eats ass literally. Oh, fuck. Uh, spoiler alert. Anyways, moving on. For a title this insane, this is one of the last films I ever expected to stick with me over the years. I remember watching this movie about two years ago. There was a special club day going on in my old school where I took up senior high. And the anime club there was doing a special double screening of this and a silent voice in a nearby audiovisual room. This would go on to be the last movie I watched with other people for a while. Because the very next day, COVID lockdown started to come into place all over the world. What a strange and ironic coincidence, having watched a cute movie all about making friends and enjoying life, in a time when we couldn't even do any of that shit because we were all stuck at home, binging on snacks and Tiger King. Sure, we had Zoom meetings and Discord as alternatives for communication, but that's not really saying much in my book. And so begs the question, what is this movie? Why did this movie live in my mind rent-free for two years? Is this genuinely good and worth a watch, even if I'm not into anime, or is it yet another boring generic anime teen drama? Well, let's find out. Let's talk about I Want to Eat Your Pancreas. If that title's still not doing any good for you, you can prefer to call it the- Before I move on, I'm gonna try to distinguish myself from Gigok's video about this film as much as possible. If you want to know more about what this is about, that video's pretty much got you covered. He's done a great job explaining this film and its themes better than I could. This video is merely my own interpretation of the film. Also worth noting that this is not the first video I've made about this film. About two years ago, I previously did an AMV of this film, set to a song by the indie rock band The National, which was my attempt to cover most of the film in just under five minutes. This time, however, I'll actually be able to explain my thoughts on the movie now that I have a mic and compare them to how I felt when I saw this movie for the first time two years ago. While I rewatched a subversion of this film in preparation for this video essay, the footage I'll be using for this video is from the dub version for accessibility purposes. It's not like the dub version is shit anyways. For what it's worth, it's actually a very decent English dub of the film. I'll also be splitting this video into two sections, one without spoilers for those learning about this film for the first time and just want a casual review, and one with spoilers for those who have seen the film and want a deeper analysis into what makes this movie so special to me and many others. Kicking things off in non-spoiler territory, I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, also known as Let Me Eat Your Pancreas, which for the record is a much, much worse title. Thank god they changed it to a more requesting I want because Let Me sounds more fear-mongering and threatening. Originated as a web novel by Japanese writer Yoru Sumino, released in 2014. Between 2016 and 2017, the novel would later be adapted into a manga as part of Futabasha's monthly action magazine. A live-action film adaptation also came out in 2017. It stars the guy from Godzilla vs. Kong. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about this film, really. I can't be bothered to watch this anytime soon. It looks pretty boring. And because the live-action film didn't really work out too well, an anime film adaptation was announced in August 2017, a month after its release, to be produced by Studio Vold, an anime studio responsible for, um, little to nothing of value. The film was also directed by Shinichiro Ushijima, who had previously worked on other animes such as Kaguya-sama and One Punch Man. And so, the anime film adaptation was finally released on September 1st, 2018. And would you believe that this simple coming-of-age drama novel paved the way for an entire franchise with its own manga, a live-action film, and an anime film all in the span of four years? Only in Japan! I swear, all that's missing is its own shitty American live-action adaptation starring Tom Holland and Zendaya as the leads. Don't get any ideas, Netflix. Regardless of which form of media you prefer, the story mainly remains the same. In this case, we're going to focus primarily on the 2018 anime film because that's the version I and many others are mostly familiar with. The film focuses on an unnamed high school boy who is antisocial and introverted. He's not really a person who prefers to 
get along with other people. While staying at a hospital to treat his appendicitis, he comes across a diary of an upbeat and outgoing 17-year-old girl named Sakura Yamauchi, who is secretly suffering from a fatal pancreatic disorder and wishes to live her life to the fullest before she dies. They soon befriend each other after he discovers that they both study in the same class together as the boy starts to spend more time with Sakura and learning more about the importance of human connection along the way. I Want to Eat Your Pancreas heavily focuses on their relationship, and so even when you're spending pretty much the first half of the film's runtime with these two, hanging out in certain places like a restaurant or a beach or a hotel, you can definitely feel these high stakes coming from these otherwise mundane slice of life scenes quite a bit, especially when you take into consideration that Sakura is going to die soon from her pancreatic disorder. You're rooting for this girl to make it, you're rooting for her to make the best out of her life before she dies. She even says a lot where she tends to find the fun in normal boring stuff. To be honest, doing normal stuff like this is almost as fun as doing anything else. If you say so. There's a sense of humility and comfort to her character that really makes you sympathize with what she's going through and still smiling, still standing tall at the end of the day. And so, it's really her chemistry with the main protagonist that almost feels like the heart of this movie. The boy being an antisocial recluse, and Sakura being the popular happy-go-lucky girl. These are very simple, conflicting character traits that allow for some really heartfelt moments with these two and how both of these characters actually develop and mature over time. I was never bored when these two were together on screen, and that probably boils down to how well written this movie is, even by teen drama and anime standards, especially how the chemistry between the two comes off very natural and grounded in reality. There's also some philosophical messages in this movie about the meaning of life that I actually find to be quite sweet and relatable and heartfelt. More on that later. It's not pretentious or self-indulgent compared to something like whatever the hell Eternals was. Hey, speaking of which, you know me. I love a good old-fashioned superhero action epic every now and then, you know? Watching Captain America beat the shit out of Thanos with Thor's hammer, or Die Hard with Bruce Willis beating the shit out of terrorists, or taking this massive plaza tower hostage on Christmas Eve. But then comes a time where I just get bored with all these movies, having the same high stakes every time, like, oh no, the multiverse is broken, or oh no, the moon's falling, and it's not good for the world, or whatever, like, okay, do it. Just destroy the fucking multiverse or moon for all I care. Which is why I love movies like this, where the stakes are much lower and more grounded in reality. It's more about the vibes. You. So you can just comfortably sit back, relax, and watch these two high school students play a cute game of truth or dare. If you had to pick from all the girls in our class, who do you think is the cutest? Why would you ask something like that? If I had to pick one, the girl I find the prettiest is... The one who's good at math. So what about me then? Where do I rank compared to the rest of the girls in class? Maybe third? I do realize I'm the one who made you answer that question, but I think I might be kind of embarrassed. Yeah, well, I think you might be kind of an idiot. <laughs> I wasn't actually expecting you to give me a serious answer. Oh. That's not to say everything about this movie works, though. There are definitely times when this film falls into the typical coming-of-age teen drama pitfalls, especially a part in the movie where the other students gush about the two leads being in a romantic relationship. I can totally hook you up with a better guy, you know. You should really take her up on that offer because you're way too good for someone like him. Hey, it's not like that. We're only friends. And the other characters that I will simply describe as the overprotective friend who wants the protagonist to stop seeing their best friend because she's worried he'll cause more pain on her. She may not look it, but she's a lot more fragile than most people are. And the tall douchebag ex-boyfriend. What else could it be then? The two of you go out to eat together, you get coffee, you go on trips, and today I find you walking away from her house! I do like that one guy though, who's basically like a comic relief, who really likes scum, and actually plays quite a pivotal role in the MC's character arc. You want some gum? Uh -huh. No thanks. I will take a piece of gum. If you don't mind. Not at all. Here. Oh. <laughs> nice catch, man. What separates this film from other teen dramas like, say, Origairu or Euphoria or the obvious comparisons to The Fault in Our Stars is that this is a film that actively tries to keep these characters and the story as authentic and natural as possible. And so when the film gets sappy, these are moments that actually feel realistic and grounded rather than being over-exaggerated to the point of either being creepy or just borderline parody. Not me. I dropped out in the fourth grade to run drugs to support my nano. 
that means you haven't known the triumphs and defeats, the epic highs and lows of high school football. The animation is also really beautiful in this film for the most part. You can tell that a lot of people, especially the animators, really cared about this film. There's a lot of beautiful visuals that give this film a much needed sense of realism that tends to be a bit of a departure from most slice of life animes in recent memory. It's definitely not as over exaggerated as your typical anime, that's for sure, which really helps in making the story feel a lot more level, believable, and realistic, but at the same time, it still looks really bright and lush in ways that could only work in anime. By these comments alone, this is one of the better coming-of-age teen dramas I've seen in recent memory, whether it be anime or live action. It's another one of those films where I just really feel like they don't make them like they used to, and even more shocking to me that this film doesn't really get a lot of talk in both the film and anime communities, which is a shame because I feel like this is one of those films that I wish got talked about more because this is definitely one of a kind that should be seen at least once. Not a lot of teen dramas I know are this well made and well written, and you can tell that a lot of creative liberty was taken into making an otherwise faithful and bittersweet adaptation of the novel that also stands on its own. Alright, spoilers everybody for the rest of this video. If you don't want to get spoiled, stop watching right now, go watch the movie, then come back to this part afterwards. Thank you! Now hit, hit it, it Johnny. Johnny! I knew nothing going into this film for the first time, aside from how sus the title sounded. And it really seemed like the entire thing was centered around the protagonist spending time with Sakura before her imminent death. Then halfway through the movie, it seemed like we were bound to get ourselves a happy ending with Sakura being discharged from the hospital after staying there for several days to have her pancreatic disorder treated. There was even the scene halfway through the movie where the two sneak out at night to watch some fireworks together, which I basically saw as the moment the protagonist's life had truly changed for the better. He was ready to open up to the world, he was ready to spend more time with her as much as he could. And so, nothing prepared me for that shocking plot twist when the protagonist watches a news report of Sakura's sudden and tragic death. Not from her pancreatic disorder, but from a stabbing. Nothing was the same afterwards, especially when you take into consideration that the last time you see Sakura on screen is when she sees the fireworks with the protagonist. Having this plot twist right after Sakura's discharge felt like having the sunniest, brightest morning of your life only to get hit by a runaway freight train. And it didn't take me until another rewatch to realize that the signs were there all along, although in the background. They kind of mentioned the stabber twice in the movie, but that was about it. There was a murder in the town next to ours recently. I saw a policeman on TV say that criminals who go around randomly killing people are the hardest to catch. As they say, the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. In previous adaptations of the story, primarily the novel, they mentioned the stabber in a more explicit manner, but here they significantly stripped down any references to Sakura's killer, most likely for the sake of condensing the story, all for better or worse. I definitely think this is a bit of an issue, because this is kind of an important plot point that ties into the climax of the story, especially with Sakura's character, meaning if you basically miss these two times where they talk about the stabber then, much like me the first time around, you probably didn't see this coming. But you know what? The truth is, maybe that was it. Maybe this plot twist was the reason why this movie stuck out with me. I never saw this coming, nor did I ever want this to happen. This was it. His only true friend, possibly his only true love, the one that changed his life forever, gone. Right when things were suddenly about to get better for the both of them. According to reports, the girl was identified as a student. Cherry blossoms always wait for the right time to come. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> to be honest, doing normal stuff like this is almost as fun as doing anything else. Wait, do you not have any friends? Want me to spend the remainder of my short life being friends with you so we can share secrets? What life event made you the happiest? The day I met you was pretty great. How do you actually feel about Sakura anyway? <clears throat> Looking out at the city at night like this is pretty romantic, isn't it? It took me 17 years to realize. But maybe I was waiting for After skipping her funeral and isolating himself at home for days on end, out of the tremendous guilt and regret he felt for not spending enough time with Sakura, he decides to visit her mother where he reads up on entries from Sakura's diary, especially a message she had left for him prior to her untimely death. From here, we also learn the protagonist's name is Haruki Shiga, meaning tree in spring, which goes well with Sakura's name meaning cherry blossom. 
barely able to cope with Sakura's sudden loss. Haruki asks her mother if he could cry, to which she allows, right before he breaks down in nothing but grief and sorrow. <laughs> What else can I say? This fucked me up. Also worth noting that I barely cry watching movies, and I've watched Terminator 2 countless times. So when I say that this was the film that broke me, I mean it's so. And the worst part of this twist? The fact that something like this can actually happen in real life. That's what I love about this movie. How it breaks away from usual slice of life anime standards by being a bit more grounded in reality and telling the audience the truth. That Sakura is not simply a cute and happy waifu for waifu. She's an average person who can live and die like any other human being. It may not be what we deserve to hear, but it is definitely something we needed to hear. Which leads me to something I want to discuss about I Want to Eat Your Pancreas. Its themes. First, the title itself. On the surface, it sounds disgusting and nasty, right? But what might be surprising to you is that this title actually makes sense in the context of the story, which is explained literally right before the opening credits. They were saying that in the past, if you had any liver problems, then you'd eat liver. And if you had stomach problems, then you would eat stomach. But I doubt I could convince anyone to let me eat theirs. So basically, you're considering cannibalism. To put it simply, it represents three things. The curse offbeats of real humor, the belief that cannibalism will allow one spirit to live inside another's body for all eternity, and her willingness to survive from her crippling pancreatic disorder with Haruki by her side. I also just want to clarify that this is not a love story per se. It may look like one on the surface, especially considering that this is the story of a girl and a boy who vibe together against her friend's wishes, but it's really more about friendship and connection. In the beginning of the film, we see that Haruki doesn't really get along with people, or at least doesn't really care about other people and what they think of him. As a result, people usually see him as a bit of a reserved loner. According to everybody else, I'm just the boring one. Assuming they don't think something worse. Sakura, being the polar opposite, changes his entire worldview and perspective on people through his constant hangouts with her. This is proven especially true later on, when he visits her in the hospital and asks her about her thoughts on living. She sees living as having a bond with others, regardless if people like or dislike you. She believes that people like her are allowed to exist whenever they're with other people, especially if it's the people we love dearly to our hearts. Most people don't really think about it, but life is filled with so much meaning. The two of us, for example. The reason we're alive is because of all the choices we've made so far. And so if you don't tend to interact with people all that often, do you basically even exist? This rings true, especially in Haruki's character arc. Hey, why are you so gloomy? We're on vacation, so cheer up, would ya? Feels a bit more like a kidnapping than a vacation, if you ask me. These themes are also alluded earlier in the film when he asks Sakura what her favorite book is, to which she replies with The Little Prince, a far more famous story that also deals with similar themes of friendship, connection, and loss. Have you ever heard of one called The Little Prince? By Saint-Exupéry? Wait, you have heard of it? It's written by a foreign author, so I thought it might be a book I knew of that you didn't, but I guess you know everything. This is also definitely not the first time anime has deeply focused on themes of loneliness and friendship, with A Silent Voice and Your Lie in April having also explored these themes in different ways prior to Pancreas. Looking back, watching this film for the first time was a bittersweet and surreal experience, especially considering that this was the very last film I'd watched right before the COVID pandemic went nationwide and sent nearly every country into lockdown. I remember re-watching it at home late at night to see if I had missed anything the first time, and then waking up the next morning suddenly having to rush to the supermarket to buy all our basic needs as the lockdowns began. School had gone online, movies had been delayed, sporting events, gaming conferences, and music festivals had been cancelled. And worst of all, people were suddenly dying left and right. Hospitals were suddenly getting bloated with COVID patients, with healthline workers rushing to treat them. As for the rest of us, we were all stuck at home doing whatever we could to stay alive, even if it meant learning new hobbies or binging our favorite shows to keep us distracted. Meanwhile, I was still processing what the fuck I had just watched the other night and wondered why a cute anime girl had to die so horribly. And so because we were all quarantining ourselves at home, a vast majority of us could barely even go outside to talk to others without a mask on. Which begs the question, because we stopped talking to other people so much because of COVID, does that mean we no longer exist? Well, 
I wouldn't say that's exactly the case. We're still living with our families. We still get to talk to our friends through social media. It ain't much, but hey, I suppose that tells us that we still have a bond with others and that we're still alive, even in a time where most people were dying. And in retrospect, I'd say this is where the film has aged surprisingly well in the COVID era. Maybe we should all strive to be like Sakura, going through difficult times with a smile on our faces, knowing we'll be able to persevere. We should all continue to keep in touch with the people we love, for those are the ones who keep us alive, whether it be family or friends. And as the pandemic begins to ease up quite a bit globally, maybe the time has finally come for us to live again, to keep our bonds with others alive and strong. And hell, maybe even making new friends along the way. That's what Haruki did at the end of the film. Maybe someday, the two of us could become friends. And I guess when Monkeypox sets the stage for another pandemic, let's all remember that we can get through whatever the world throws at us. Hopefully, as long as we continue to be with our loved ones because they're the reason why we're all still alive at this very moment. I know it's very cliche to say that no man is an island, but it's a phrase that's as tried and true as ever. And no, eating each other's pancreases is no good way to survive, contrary to what Sakura thinks. That is, unless you want to start another pandemic, of course. So I'm going to close, but I, I just wanted to, to share that with you this morning. Young people, I love you. I do. I, I love young people. My grandmother always said, you know, when a baby smiles, the angels sing. And that's true. You're the backbone of the world. I don't care if you're in Asia, Africa, Korea, Japan. I don't care where you are, the United States. You are the leaders, the future leaders of this world. So reach out. Be yourself. Don't be afraid to, 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 to go after what you need. So I love you. Have a great day. And I'll see you tomorrow. Forever